The final battle in the Great War against ASIC corruption. Coming up on Citizens Insight. Welcome to Citizens Insight, the Citizens Party's interview series on matters of national and international importance. I'm Robert Barwick, and rejoining me again today is one of our more regular guests, John Adams. Welcome back, John. Hello, Robbie. So you're back in Melbourne. You can't keep away. Is it because Dan Andrews isn't here anymore? You're game to show your face? No, no, no. <laughs> well, I mean, look, uh, very interesting you should say that, Robbie. This is the first time I'm actually on camera where people can see me in 12 months. The last time I was on camera was here in July last yep. year. So, so we are back. So we are privileged to have you. You're a bit of a mystery man on the other channels, but you're on camera here. That's yeah, good. Yeah, so well, I am on camera here, so I am a real person. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I mean, what I want to say, Robbie, is just to get the conversation started, a couple of things is um, we talked 12 months ago about the ASIC inquiry. Yep. Um, and um, it was, so, so now we're going to talk about how the ASIC inquiry finished and what comes next. But I do, you know, f particularly for those... Uh, uh, supporters of the Citizens Party, I do want to shout out and, and, and thank you and the whole team um, in terms of your efforts. I know you guys were, were busy with the banking inquiry, but um, on the day, people need to know that on the day that the Senate voted f to establish the ASIC inquiry, you and the team here were instrumental to help us get that political support to, to get us over the edge, even though Joseph Longer, the chair of ASIC, gave yeah. specific instructions to manipulate Parliament um, uh, for the inquiry not to go ahead. And the email I was able to obtain about the Longo instruction actually made it into the inquiry report, uh, which was which was quite interesting. But so, then, but so the chair of ASIC was actually, who's essentially a public servant, was actually um, improperly lobbying senators not to establish this inquiry. The Citizens Party, what you're crediting us for, is we did what we'd like to do, put out the call to our supporters and said, call everybody and say we need an inquiry. And the inquiry got up. Indeed, indeed. Uh, but, 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 but also during the inquiry, uh, I mean, a number of um, uh, people who have been hard done by, by ASIC that mm. the Citizens Party has supported, whether bank victims or Sterling, etc., a number of these voices came forward to make sure that these historical cases were brought again to the committee's attention because um, ASIC is not a new phenomenon. No. It is a 20-year-plus problem that has continued to get worse. Um, and, and Robbie, you know, I've said this in other forums. I, I want to say here on this channel, I, I, I used to be a Commonwealth public servant. That's how I started my career after finishing university. Um, I've been in good work environments. I've been in poor work environments. I know what a good public service looks like and an ethical public service. Yep. I have, honest to God, I have never seen anything like ASIC in my life. It is thoroughly corrupt. Um, and, and when I say corrupt, they are openly lying to parliament, lying to courts, lying to the media. They are rigging investigations um, and they are completely out of control. Um, and, and Senator Bragg talked about the sick culture at ASIC. It is, it is beyond sick. It, it, it is just, I mean, we have had examples in Australian history of systemic corruption in the police forces. Yep. So we think about 1995 and the Woodrow Commission in the New South Wales Police, go back to the Fitzgerald Inquiry with Terry Lewis and the Queensland Police in the 1980s. I think what I have seen um, up close the last two, three years with ASIC, I think we are dealing with, with major systemic corruption in that leadership group. Now, one thing I want to say to the audience is when we talked about establishing the ASIC Inquiry in mid-2022, we, we both said that there was a particular official that we thought was very problematic, yep. Warren Day. And we said that he was our number one target. We wanted to get rid of him. He has now gone. I think that's a positive move. Um, and that's one of the things that we both had hoped to achieve. And we did achieve that. But um, there is still um, so much problems at the, in terms of this place. And even today, um, ASIC has released a press release about a particular matter. Uh, tomorrow, while I'm in Melbourne, I'm meeting the people who have been named in the press release, 
And these people say ASIC went to court and just lied about this whole matter. Um, materially facts either admitted, also look omitted, or they, they, they said things to the court which were factually not true at all. Um, and because it is ASIC and because it is part of the government, judges give prosecutors an ASIC preferential treatment. So, mm. so they think, well, you know... Yeah, there's a bias towards them. It, it's a bias towards them. And so it, it's super hard to question ASIC, but, but, but you know, um, well, in the last set round of Senate estimates, ASIC got super agitated about me um, and the so-called complaint, in which they, which they, 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 they didn't mention my name. But uh, I think in, in a phone conversation, you said that uh, maybe I'm the only one who in the last 20 years have got really under their skin. Well, let me say a few things to bring us to where we are, because I want to situate this, because I to back up that statement. Um, so ASIC started essentially 1998. Before that, it was called the Australian Securities Commission, the ASC. And mm -hmm. it was born mm -hmm. out of the Wallace um, inquiry, financial system inquiry. Um, and there's an aspect of that I, I hope we have time to talk about in a little bit. But just to make this brief, um, it's always been, from the very beginning, a weak and ineffective regulator. In the year 2000, uh, Adele Ferguson, um, writing in the uh, Financial Review, called it the watchdog no one fears, right? And the current chair, by the way, of ASIC, Joe Longo, was the head of enforcement back then when Adele Ferguson wrote that. And because it was this weak regulator, what, we, what, what it kicked off was this period of absolute financial rogues, financial predators running um, free, on a free-for-all across the Australian landscape, like a Wild West, and no one was, was protected from them because there was no deterrent against them. And the bodies started piling up. And people like Denise Braley, who from the <coughs> Banking and Financial Consumer Support Association, she started you know, um, picking up these cases in the, in, the, in the latter half of the 2000s. The, these, these victims just started piling up and there were thousands of them. Then there were tens of thousands and there were hundreds of thousands. That's, that led eventually to some big inquiries. There was a big inquiry into ASIC in 2014, which slammed ASIC. It was damning of ASIC. There was the Royal Commission in 2018, which was damning of ASIC, absolutely slammed ASIC. There was the Sterling inquiry that we helped to get started in 2021, the Sterling First inquiry, and that's when you and I did a lot of comparing of notes on how ASIC worked. Um, and that was highly critical of ASIC, right? And while these were damning inquiries and highly critical, Nothing changed. And then you came along, and the, what, the, the credit I, I um, am more than happy to give you is, I think um, the way I assessed it is ASIC had never come across anyone like you. Because what normally happens with ASIC is they, they, the people who complain about them are the financial victims who receive absolutely no attention from ASIC at all. And these victims are dazed and confused and bankrupt, etc. That's why the, you know they're reaching out to ASIC for help, and they find there is no regulator there that that does anything for them. And so, um, ASIC has it over them in spades, right? But you came along with a lot better experience. You weren't a dazed and confused financial victim. You brought all your experience of how government should work to this. Um, you have your own complaint with ASIC, which you can talk about if you want, probably relating to this little coin here you can plug later. Sure. Um, uh, but you also looked at the statistics of ASIC to realise this, if you're going to get a complaint up to ASIC to be investigated, you've got to jump through hurdles of, an a, of a, a regulator that only investigates fewer than 1% of complaints it receives. Um, and that's what triggered the inquiry. And you've been able to ride that inquiry throughout its 20 months right, in, in, um, intersected a lot, create a lot of the, the sort of the, the, the discussion in the community around ASIC as this inquiry was going on. And so that contributed to an inquiry that I believe is qualitatively different than the other inquiries because, and this is what I'll come to now, it's handed down a very, very strong recommendation that is unequivocal, right, that um, you know, it's there for the government to take up if it's going to be prepared to clean up. So that's where we're at at the moment. Um, so give us your assessment of the inquiry itself and the recommendations and why, you, whether you support them and why you think, why well, you do. Well, I mean, the thing is, uh, on the day the inquiry report came out, I, I said <coughs> a quote to a number of journalists across the country. I said this was a landmark report 
and it was a once in a generation report. And, and, and those, those phrases was actually mentioned last week in the Financial Review. Um, um, I, I mean, and, and, you know, you know, that, that, you know, the Financial Review was trying to say that yeah, some people took this view that it was landmark and once in a generation. And it was once in a generation because this is the first time that the, that the parliamentary inquiry has said ASIC has categorically failed. It is broken. It is sick. It cannot fix itself. We have to abolish it. Um, and, 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 you know, um, one of the, and, and obviously Senator Well, that's Br just before you go on, that's dead. Like, people should let the, the, the weight of that hang in the air. The, the Senate inquiry has called for the abolition of the, one of the, the um, twin pillars of Australian financial <coughs> regulation. That's yes. huge. Absolutely. He, he, one thing I can reveal to the audience, Robbie, is, is that in November of 2022, I had a private meeting with Senator Bragg in his office in Sydney. Um, and, and, and I said to him point blank, I said, we are already, so, so this was maybe like a month, month and a half into the inquiry. I said, we are already getting signals from certain stakeholders. They don't want to participate in the inquiry because um, they said, we've seen this all, be, we've seen this movie before. We, we, we get our hopes up. So no, we, yep. we, we, we become hopeful. We participate thinking that something's gonna change and nothing ever changes. Um, um, and, and, and I said to Senator Bragg, to give the community confidence and hope um, that we're gonna have, we're gonna get on top of financial crime, this time has to be different. Because if it's, if it's a do nothing inquiry or if it's a weak inquiry report, all the people who are saying th there's no point in participating in the Bragg inquiry, they're gonna be vindicated. And, and I said, that's the political challenge. And can I say this, Robbie? There were a number of people who were heavily involved in the inquiry during the process who had question marks about Senator Bragg. Mm. Um, uh, there were questions at the beginning um, you know, some of our friends in Parliament. Well, well, let, well let's just name one because he's a. It's, we can, it's a bit of a tribute to him. There's a, as as you and I both agree, the, <coughs> the very best Greens advisor we've ever met, and one of the very best advisors we've ever met in Parliament, is the late Fraser Brinley, mm -hmm. who was instrumental in pushing the Greens to go beyond just green issues and, and take up some of these issues of how the financial system works. Mm -hmm. And he was incredibly sceptical. He's a very good collaborator. He was a very good collaborator of ours. He was incredibly sceptical at this at, at Bragg yes. being the one to take up this inquiry. Yes, I I personally think you'll never know now because Fraser passed away last year, but I personally think he would grudgingly, perhaps, but nevertheless, acknowledge that this became something he didn't anticipate. No, no, no look, not only did Fraser not anticipate it. I mean, I mean, can I say people at the beginning of this year? you know, January, February, March, yeah. had question marks as to what was Bragg going to, uh, to, what he was going to deliver. Now, I had a meeting with Senator Bragg in March of this year, so he had given me um, some broad themes as to what was going to look like, but what did the final um, report look like? Um, I, I didn't know, but he told me it was gonna be very strong, and he delivered. Mm, he, he, did. He, 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 he delivered, and you know, um, you know, I used to work for the Liberal Party. Uh, I'm now not, not, I'm not a member of any political party, but, but for me, I don't care about your political affiliation um, or party affiliation. Um, I, I want to applaud good work, whoever does good work. And um, he, was, he was one of the only senators to call out um, what was so obvious to so many people. And you still see today in the mainstream media, sycophants trying to defend ASIC. And, 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 and you have these people, like even Chairman Longo says, people don't understand ASIC, uh, this criticism. You know, this inquiry report that I wrote, um, also my public report that I wrote in 2022, I use ASIC's own numbers and put them on a chart and I said, you know, over the last 11 years, the trend is getting worse. So that, yes, while the headline was the risk getting less than 1%, the trend was actually getting worse over time, mm. despite more resources and more staff, and and, and so the the big and question, the royal commission, despite the royal commission, where there was you know the, uh, supposedly some behavioural change afterwards, and no, the trend was getting worse. The, the trend was getting worse. Um, it was getting worse in terms of no further action. It was getting worse in terms of the number of investigations, the rate of investigation, all, all those sort of things. And so the the key thing that I was wanting the inquiry to answer is why is it getting worse. Um, and, 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 you know, ASIC has had 
almost, two, well, look at, well, I mean, what are we thinking? A year and a half, at least, or 20, 21 months, to answer the question, why did, why did their data behave the way it did? Now, in September of 2022, so a month before I published the report, I had a meeting with Warren Day and Louise McCauley in Sydney um, um, for an hour, and I asked them point blank, you are the chief operating officer at ASIC. Why does your data behave the way it does? He could not answer the question. And this, guy's on, this guy was on half a million dollars a year. And in the last two years, so, so when, when Longa says, I don't understand, now, I understand, but you can't explain your own numbers um, and why your organization is behaving the way it is. And, and now I do want to segue is, so why has ASIC gotten worse over time? And I would argue that now, and last year is is perhaps rock bottom for ASIC. Yeah. And, and we can tell this by not the conspiracy theorist John Adams or the renegade Robbie Barwick, it's ASIC staff. This staff survey, and I'm not sure if you've, maybe you've done on the weekly updates um, with your with your followers. I, I, I probably only mentioned it in passing, but and, and maybe when we put this show up, we'll have a graphic to back up what you're about to say, but just describe the survey. So, so, so basically November last year, November 2023, 2023, 1,056 staff responded to a detailed staff survey. So half the staff, there's 2,000 staff in ASIC, half of them responded. Well, the, the, the response rate, they said, was 61%. Oh, more so, than half. More more, than half. So, okay. so, so, so more than half. Um, so, so what were the numbers? Um, roll clarity, 26, so, so on a scale of 1 to 100, roll clarity, 26%. Only a quarter of people know what their <laughs> know job what is doing. at ASIC. Um, <laughs> mo, mo, um, like motivation. 22%. How motivated are you to work at ASIC? 22% are motivated. Satisfaction, 18%. Um, intention to stay, 31%. And organizational level quality, I kid you not, ladies and gentlemen, 2%. Two out of a hundred. This is a thousand and fifty-six ASIC staff says their organisation um, on a scale of one to a hundred or zero to a hundred, th they rank their own organisation at two percent. And you know, last month when I was in Parliament, um, I went around to politicians, advisors, and the, and journalists, and I said, in the the federal government was established in 1901. This is the worst result, arguably, in 123 years. Um, and, and so in the last week, we have Chairman Longo in the mainstream media saying, ASIC has now turned the corner. Can I, can I say, uh, Robbie, whether you're in uh, government, private sector, the military, whatever, if you are a, a leader and, and you get a rating from your own team of two out of yeah. 100, what does that say? Your team does not believe in you or your leadership, and you got to go. And 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 that's why one. That's one of the big reasons why in the last twenty four hours, the Citizens Party has published a press release calling for Longo to be sacked. And, and if Longo had any any shame about him, he would resign. The man's on eight hundred and twenty four thousand dollars a year with a two percent rating from his own team. Um, this this leadership team of Longo and Court um, and some of these other monkeys there, it is just so toxic. Um, and, and, and people may say it's radical for John Adams to call corruption because corruption is a very serious allegation. Sure. I have had many people say to me, they're not corrupt, they just don't know what they're doing. No, 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 I have seen up close how these individuals behave in the workplace. They are corrupt and you can tell why they're corrupt. It's because they are so crooked and unethical, their own staff yep. are revolting against the corruption inside that organization. If that, if that survey does not prove a demoralized workforce, and why would you be demoralized if you work at ASIC? Because the reason you assume you were joining ASIC, which was to police financial crime, you get in there and you're not allowed to. They do not police financial crime. Oh no, no but, but but it is worse than that. It is it, it is worse than that, Robbie. Um, when when the leadership of ASIC has a particular target, um, they will basically um, tell the, the instruct the staff. So this is the way I've been. Uh, multiple people ha has has described this uh, culture. It's very top down, hierarchical, mm. and it's like you know, you're walking on eggshells and you can't push back against your management uh, team. So if you're a junior lawyer at ASIC and you get uh, a phone call from 
the chairman, the deputy chair, or you know someone in, in the senior executive leadership team, and they say, we want you to do this. If you don't do it, guess what? You're at the door. So, so and I've heard good people who worked at ASIC don't last long because yeah. they go in there, they realise the culture, they go, you know, the pay's not good, the culture's terrible, I'm not acting in the public interest, I want to go somewhere else. So the people at ASIC, can I say, um, you know, w when we talk about the, the, the Nuremberg trial, the defence was, I'm following orders. Yeah. The people who are just the lemmings that are going to go along with the corrupt instructions, they're the ones that are there because they want a job, not because they're motivated to act in the public interest. They, 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 just, they just say, hey, the order is the order and we're just going to go with it. Um, and yet, you know, so you have, you know, um, com ethically compromised poor performing staff um, and, and, and they, in their own staff survey, have revolted against their own leadership team. I mean, it, so it's, actually, it's actually quite serious, Robbie, because, and sorry to harp on a bit, because I'm really energised about this, because when it comes to, so, so, so your party deals with uh, the financial victims when, when things go wrong at ASIC. Um, or when, or so when, when, when financial crimes don't get um, either you know uh, policed, uh, in, like you know there's not a proper investigation, or the investigation's too late. So 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 you you've had you've spent a lot of time with victims who have cried about their financial circumstances, yeah. how destitute they've been, and all of that. And these are heartbreaking stories. And I'm thinking to myself, Australia doesn't have to be like this. And, and while there are issues around structure and funding and all of this sort of stuff, um, ASIC has enormous powers, more powers than state police. And 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 they if they if they have a target in mind, they will rig a case to go after that target, including mm. lying to the court. Mm. And then in other instances when they want to be hands off, like in my package case, and we can talk about this, what do they do? They they allowed the evidence to be altered and rigged um, by giving um, the the target um, ch a chance to cover their tracks, and then they write to me, "Oh, we couldn't find the evidence." Well, when you rig an investigation and you give certain individuals in the corporate sector time to destroy the evidence, what? Ha of course, of course, you can't find the evidence. And so, but but again, it, why are we paying taxes yep. when, when public servants are behaving like this? It's, it's beyond me. Well, so Joe Longo's. Um, excuse in the financial review on Saturday in this article that was a I saw it as a snide attempt to marginalise what you're doing and people like Associate Professor Andy Schmulo and even Dr John Hewson, the former leader of the Liberal Party, and they they described it as a motley crew, um, you know, operating in social media echo chambers, etc. And then they gave Longo this opportunity to justify himself, right? And he said they don't understand the way ASIC does things and. And Joe Longo returned to a theme that was actually talked about with him 20 years previously, which is that we can only take up, say, 250 investigations a year out of the 10,000 we get. And so we want these to be high impact. That's actually a term he sometimes uses, high impact. Um, and that's his logic, right? That we, we are, you know, we're, we're taking up these cases to, to send a message. Well, if you're going to adopt that kind of approach, <coughs> because I, what John and I have discussed exhaustively is my attitude originally was and still is a bit you know if you're the police you got to police everything you can if you talk about actual police you, you the police you can't go to the local Faulkner police station here near Oust and say and run up there and say I'm reporting a crime and those police can't can't say oh we're not interested that's a that's out that's outside our quota today right yeah, now they've yeah. got to respond to it right yeah, yeah. but ASIC's attitude is no that's outside our quota um, so, okay, if that's going to be your method, then the only way that will work to provide any kind of deterrent against financial crime is if those 250 cases a year are so high impact, they're so devastating for the perpetrators that the very name ASIC strikes fear into the heart of everybody in the financial system, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And is that the case? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. It is, so, so he has he, he makes a claim that, oh, this is our approach, but he doesn't back up that approach at all. And then, as the, the one that blew my mind, which we mentioned in the release today, is, is, um, or yesterday, is the fact that uh, you know, the, the inquiry actually showed examples where proper professional organisations of high standing, highly reputable, made 
and you know, not conspiracy theorist John Adams or renegade Robbie, made proper complaints to ASIC and they were rejected or labelled no further action, which is ASIC's favourite acronym, NFA, acronym, acronym, NFA, no further action, within 45 seconds. In other words, nobody at ASIC <laughs> assessed this case at all. Yes. They just rejected it, right? That is a regulator that doesn't want to regulate. Yes. And that's a policeman that doesn't want to police. Now, while you rest your voice for a bit, I just want to, just want to mention something just to situate why we put out this release because um, I got quite disgusted that after this inquiry has come, come down with the recommendation that it has, instead of engaging with the recommendations in good faith, Joe Longo has gone out there to use the media to campaign against them. And so what we did in this release is just re reveal to people who Longo was. And here's the quick timeline. In 1992, he was Alan Bond's lawyer. And he wrote an article in the Australian Institute of Criminology at the time complaining that the then predecessor for ASIC, ASC, had overreacted, they were his words, to people like Bondi and Christopher Scase and all these corporate cowboys of the 80s who ripped a lot of people off. They'd overreacted to that and their overreaction was um, uh, not respecting the civil rights of white collar criminals. That's actually what he wrote in that report. He was worried about the civil liberties of white collar criminals. In 1995, while he's still Bond's lawyer, somehow he got a gig, John, as a consultant to the ASC, to the regulator. <coughs> and then within a year, he became the national head of enforcement for the ASC. And that's in 96. In 98, ASIC is founded out of the ASC as a result of the Wallace Inquiry. But the Wallace Inquiry actually recognised that ASIC was a terrible regulator and a poor, very poor at law enforcement, even then. And so they recommended that the role of law enforcement not go to ASIC, but go to the ACCC, then under Professor Alan Fells. And Alan Fells testified at the November 1st hearing of this inquiry last mm -hmm, year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He testified, he was asked, why didn't it happen? He said, because the, the financial services industry, i.e. the banks, lobbied Treasury to make sure it didn't happen. And he said, Fells said, in his view, Treasury was usually pretty good at resisting vested interests, except the financial services industry. And he told the story about how he had a meeting with a couple of officials from Treasury who insisted that enforcement must stay with ASIC, which meant, John, enforcement must stay with Longo, who was ahead of ASIC mm -hmm. enforcement at the time. And Fells, and they got their way, and Fells observed that later, those two officials he spoke with became high-paid high-ranking officials at banks. And this is the revolving door between the banks and treasury. And so we, we say, when we talk about this corruption, the motivation for the corruption is the banks. The banks want a weak and ineffective regulator. Anyway, within a couple of years, as I mentioned before, Adele Ferguson was commenting on Longo's record as this is the watchdog that doesn't bark. Longo then went and spent about 17 years working for Deutsche Bank, mm -hmm. the most probably probably the most corrupt bank in the world including in their UK office. After the Royal Commission, there was a directive from the Royal Commission saying, you've got to beef up law enforcement. The Royal Commissioner, Kenneth Haynes, said to ASIC, ask yourself the question, why not litigate? Instead of having these slaps on the wrist to banks called enforceable undertakings, take them to court, right? Actually charge them. Remember, he, remember they, when they talked about fees for no service and, and charging dead people, Longo had to, I mean, Kenneth Hayne in the Royal Commission had to intervene in the testimony and say, do you know this is theft? This is actually a, a criminal offence, what you're talking about. Absolutely. Right? And these bank executives were very shocked to hear the commissioner saying that, but that's the reality. So he said, look, you've got to go after them. He actually said, he also said that while the, the cost to banks of crime and corruption was less than the profit they made from it, it would never stop. And that's why he went after ASIC. So coming out of that Royal Commission, James Shipton and his head of enforcement, Daniel Crennan, said, tried to, there was evidence they tried to beef up um, law enforcement. Daniel Crennan famously said, the banks should fear us. Yes. Well, but by 2021, they were out. And, jo and Josh Frydenberg, who was also at Deutsche Bank previously before getting into Parliament, Josh Frydenberg turned to Joe Longo to bring this guy, Joe Longo, back from the private sector. And the Financial Review described him as the business-friendly regulator craved by Treasurer Josh Frydenberg. And the first thing Longo did was scrap 
Kenneth Haynes directive, why not litigate? Scrap the, the emphasis on law enforcement. And that's why, although you could say Longo is a new chairman, right? He actually does represent the whole history of ASIC as a dysfunctional failed regulator. And for him to now come out and actively oppose those recommendations, I think exposes who he really is. And that's why we called for him to be fired. So that said, let's talk about, because let's get a bit technical and you can- Well, I mean, look, can I just make a couple of points? And I'm gonna ask you to explain the actual recommendation in a bit of detail. So get a little bit technical, but make your points first. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, 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 so you mentioned how Shipton, the former chairman of ASIC, was like he 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 went on a on a particular expenses scandal, and then so did Crennan, yeah. the, the deputy who who did the why not litigate. So why did they why were they tossed out? Because there was a mole inside ASIC, yeah. former treasury, who who was the instigator um, to there was a conspiracy to have them removed, and that person is called Karen Chester. Um, and, and Chester, is, and obviously the Chester Shipton Civil War. And she was a commissioner, right? She was the deputy chair, deputy chair. of ASIC. She was, in, 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 she was involved in a civil war with James Shipton. Um, you know, there have been multiple uh, articles in both the Financial Review and the Australian newspaper about the civil war to the point that they, the Treasury spent $180,000 on a secret um, performance assurance review of her performance um, about, about uh, how bad she was. And then obviously when Wun Longo came in, uh, he had the options of, of, of uh, in doing things under the ASIC code of conduct and he looked the other way. Now, it's interesting because I just want to mention because because we, we it hasn't been fully put on the record yet. I'm happy on this yeah. interview to say on the record that on the 5th of February of this year, the Australian newspaper on the front page of the Week in Australia reported that Chester had been sent to the NAC, the National Anti-Corruption Commission, um, and she's uh, under she's still under investigation. Well, who sent her to the NAC? Yours truly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I sent her to the NAC on, on something very specific. But By sent her, you mean you made an official complaint to the NAC? Yes. And it's taken up at the, it's passed the threshold for investigation. It, it's, it's, been, it, it's been like, so, so we're at the, what is today, the 31st of July? Yeah. This Friday <laughs> is the one year anniversary of Chester at the NAC. So I've, I've submitted six rounds of evidence to the NAC about. Uh, about a particular issue that I became aware of, but can I say- and the first threshold though was 90 days, right? 90 days, which is the initial assessment, and the initial assessment looks at, are you a Commonwealth official? Um, and is there an allegation of corruption which meets the definition of Section 8 of the Act? Yep. Um, because there's a whole bunch of allegations which under the legislation technically isn't corruption. So you've got to be able to articulate, does this behavior um, it doesn't meet the threshold of, of corruption, and if it does, then they'll go into investigation. And so, if it doesn't, you get notified within the ninety days. Yes. And so, the fact that it's been a year, clearly, the NAC is looking at something. Well, look, only in the last forty-eight hours have I been told by certain sources that the NAC has done some interviews oh. um, 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 oh. uh, in relation to the Chester matter. Uh, but, 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 but you and I are in the same company because we both have referred. Yep. Um, high profile people to the NAC and both of us have passed, the, passed 90, the threshold, yep. the 90 day threshold. So my, the, my re referral on behalf of the Citizens Party was, to Scott, was for Scott Morrison, cashing in on AUKUS after he secretly conspired to foist AUKUS on us in his last years as uh, Prime Minister and then used his, used his 18, month as a 18 months as a backbench, backbencher to line up the jobs he would take cashing in on AUKUS. So I referred that to the NAC and it's past the 90 day threshold. So I don't know where the, the investigation's up to, but something is happening on that front as well. Yes. And uh, we'll do an update on that soon. So, so, so yes, yeah, so, so, so I did Chester last year. Uh, at the beginning of this year, you did uh, Morrison. And then on the 3rd of June, uh, well, on the 4th of June, actually, uh, fireworks and Senate estimates with Senator Roberts because yeah. <laughs> the day before, on the 3rd of June, I referred the Prime Minister, our current Prime Minister, Albanese. So you did the former, I've done the current one. And I referred Longo, Sarah Court, and, and 10 other uh, ASIC officials to the NAC about one of their, their investigation into the so-called package because 
Um, and we can talk about how I learnt about what they did, but, but the whole investigation was rigged from start to finish. And so I said to, I asked the question, Nack, um, are they that are they this stupid or are they corrupt? That is that is the sixty four million dollar question on, on that particular issue. So 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 again, so our, here's the thing. So, so when we talk about the political challenge, so we can talk about what you and I are going to do moving forward about the brag recommendations and getting these technical recommendations implemented. But um, if the whole regime is so corrupt to the point that you got senior public officials going into the media and just blatantly ignoring you know, the reality that we can all see and just lie um, to the public and to say there's, you know, longer in the last fortnight I said there's no case to split up ASIC, no case. As, no. as, as if as if all the people who came forward in the inquiry and, and all the and all the experts, uh, and Professor Schmulo has, has hundreds of papers from around the world that talk about the structure of ASIC being wrong because in other jurisdictions um, uh, they have a different structure. And we'll get into this in a second. So. You asked about the technical recommendation. Yeah, just so, explain that. So, 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 in Hong Kong, Singapore, UK, for example, there is a corporate regulator um, that regulates companies in general across the uh, across the economy, and then you have a financial uh, services conduct authority, which f focuses on the banks and the broader financial sector. Australia's only the, Australia's one of the most unique jurisdictions in the world where we've taken these two separate jobs and put them into one and made it into ASIC. And, and the reason it's separate in these other jurisdictions is because financial, <laughs> the financial sector is complex. Yes. It's very complex. There's a quote that we love from a British parliamentary debate in 2014 on Glass-Steagall separating banks between investment banks and deposit taking banks. And the, the, the Lord, one of the members of the House of Lords who participate in these debate, debates, um, taught, he was a former investment banker himself and he said, Investment bankers are extremely adept at getting between the wallpaper and the wall. Yes. Right? And so the, anyone who knows the sector knows that it's, they, there's all sorts of ways to bamboozle people. So you need a specialised regulator equipped with specialised people who can detect that stuff. Yes. Right? And to lump it in with a company's regulator, <coughs> you know, is, is just watering down your capabilities, essentially. Y yes, yes. And, 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 you know, right throughout the inquiry, Everyone said, even even the, the supporters of ASIC, and there were some few supporters who testified in the inquiry. They all said that ASIC has a lot to do, um, too much to do, um, and and one of the big problems why ASIC has gotten worse over the last twenty years is that. And Senator Bragg said this in one of his speeches in Parliament, is that. Uh, Treasury in the Parliament has continued to add more and more responsibility to ASIC without the requisite funding and, and the resources, and they've just got way too much to do. Um, and, 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 and obviously the theory is, if you uh, copy the UK, Singapore and Hong Kong, not, not that it's going to be perfect because, of, particularly in the UK, um, you know, their performance is quite bad as well, but you, know, you can't have an organisation that is not focused um, and has too many responsibilities and, and you know are, are chasing too many rats yeah. um, and, 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 so, and so again um, you know when you look at the international architecture around the world the Bragg recommendation isn't radical at all it, it's actually based on good international evidence um, and we're just saying all these other countries do do this we do something different and it's not working so let's actually go to what the other countries actually do and, so, and so what's so radical about that that's right and just and like days after the recommendation came out there was a radio abc radio i think it was interviewed Sydney University professor Jason Harris, who's Australia's top expert in the Corporations Act. Yes. And he backed up the recommendation as yes. important. And then ASIC called the ABC to, to background against him and dismiss his support for the recommendation, right, as if he's some kind of hack, where, when ASIC's copy, own copy of the Corporations Act is annotated by Professor Harris. <laughs> they use his annotated copy of the Corporations Act to inform them about what they're supposed to do. So this is, a, this is crazy. Here you are, but like the bleeding minds have endorsed this. The only obstacle is this dysfunctional, corrupt regulator, and that's why it's got to go. Uh, can, can, I, can I just say that because because you've just highlighted a point. I want the public to know this, is that um, this media team and ASIC is just out of control. I mean, I mean, when you criticise, I mean, look, I mean, we're talking as if 
I don't know, it's like Nazi Germany and you have to praise the Fuhrer. Um, anytime you criticise, anytime you criticise ASIC, people at ASIC will attack the, uh, the, the press um, or, or attack the person yeah. um, uh, criticising ASIC. And they'll say all sorts of things about people and say whether it's, you know, me or whether it's Professor Harris or Associate Professor Schmulow or other people, um, they try to attack they play the man, not the ball, attack the character. Can I just say this for the record? Last November, in Melbourne, ASIC held the ASIC Forum, and a journalist yeah. from the Financial Review was, was effectively physically pinned in a corner of a room by the general counsel of ASIC and said, why the hell are you talking to that um, lunatic John Adams? <laughs> he, he, you know, he, he, he's just crazy. Um, you're supposed to be a responsible journalist, a serious journalist. Uh, no one in Australia should be talking about John Adams. Um, and, and I'm thinking to myself, and, and, and so he's saying, you want to criticise me, that's fine, but to physically impose yourself um, in, a, in a public space with a journalist and you're being paid by the taxpayer, who does this? Stuff? I mean, look, can I just say, <laughs> I won't mention the journalist's names out of respect, but the journalist said to me, he thought this was quite disturbing behaviour by the general counsel, and he just said this general counsel is quote literally out of control. I mean, it, it's, well, why it's just... don't we just for the sake of for the for the benefit of our viewer? Now, if we have time, I'm going to ask the producer to insert this. Otherwise, we'll put a link below, but we so that people can actually see the video of Chris Savundra, the general counsel, in the Senate hearing responding to Malcolm Roberts, reading out a statement about you, the complainant. Yes. Just after, Mel and we'll, we'll show Malcolm Roberts introducing it, re referencing the fact that there's been a referral to the NAC. Yes. And so I think people should have a look at that. So you'll know if we've, if we've decided we've got time because it'll, it'll be here right now and you can watch it. To the bullion company I've asked about before, I do need to be careful with my words as the matter is now before the National Corruption Commission. The question all along has been, did ASIC give the company so much warning of the audit that, they were able to, that the company was able to do two things? Buy the bullion they were charging customers for storing, but hadn't bothered to yet to buy. Move bullion around to misrepresent their stock. Since we met on this issue, another whistleblower has all come forward to testify they were personally involved in moving bullion around to defeat the audit, to bypass it. My question is, did, your, did you allow for the chance of and defeat the moving of bullion to rig the audit? So perhaps I will answer that question first, um, Senator Roberts, and I'm then going to pass to my colleague, Mr Savundra, because you have raised an issue about the National Anti-Corruption uh, Commission, which is a most serious uh, allegation. It is. In relation to this issue, as you're aware, uh, ASIC has conducted an extensive investigation in relation to various allegations of a particular gold bullion company. Uh, we have done everything uh, that we would normally do in an investigation, uh, Senator, um, and certainly reject any suggestion that anything inappropriate has been done or people tipped off, I think, to use, uh, to use the language in your question. Uh, but I am going to pass with the Chair's leave to Mr Savundra now to deal with some of the other elements of your question. Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, you, you raised um, the matter of um, a referral to the National Anti-Corruption Commission, and I wanted to uh, uh, put some information on the record regarding that. So late last Friday, ASIC received correspondence from a complainant. My, my question has been... Uh, it's important, Senator, Senator, Roberts, Senator, Senator Roberts, I'll give Mr Savundra the yeah. call. Um, Mr. Savundra. Late last Friday, ASIC received correspondence from a complainant well known to ASIC. The complainant has submitted a number of reports of misconduct to ASIC relating to a particular entity. His original report of misconduct was investigated by ASIC it required the expenditure of considerable time and resources. ASIC has an open investigation in relation to a further report of misconduct from the same complainant relating to the same entity and other entities in the same industry. ASIC is close to finalising this aspect. Again, this has required the expenditure of considerable time and resources by ASIC. ASIC has corresponded 
with and met the complainant on several occasions during this period. We've also responded to about 40 freedom of information requests from the claimant and five FOI requests, which we understand were authored by the complainant but submitted by someone else. In total, ASIC has spent more than 650 hours responding to these requests. ASIC has also responded to four questions on notice from this committee and other committees in relation to the matter the complainant is concerned with. In correspondence from the complainant last Friday, he indicates that he remains dissatisfied with ASIC's conduct of its original investigation and states, as you've mentioned, that he has referred several ASIC officials to the NAC for investigation, including Deputy Chair Court. He states this is in addition to his existing referral of the former Deputy Chair, Karen Chester. He indicates that he will also be providing output of his work to multiple committees within the Australian Senate and the Australian Federal Police. The complainant also states in the letter that if ASIC did not by 5 p.m. that same day, indicate its intention to meet with him, he will be informing the Australian people of the real truth of ASIC's investigation. The complainant says that he has been working full time for an extended period on these issues and refers to reports he has drafted that span many hundreds of pages and contain many hundreds of exhibits. ASIC was provided with a copy of the report and supporting material yesterday afternoon. Um, we will examine that report. We understand this material has been referred to the NAC and will be referred to the AFP and no doubt other agencies. In the covering letter, the complainant requests that ASIC, amongst various other requests, formally engages him and his team to undertake a further investigation into the entity. We assume the complainant is seeking for this to be occurred on a paid basis, and we note that the complainant has previously sought payment from ASIC for the work he has done to date. We have advised the NAC of the issue. We recognise the important work of the NAC and will, of course, fully cooperate um, with any investigation it proposes to undertake. The complainant has also made a number of speculative allegations relating to ASIC's conduct including via social media. Based on the available information to ASIC, these allegations appear to be baseless and lacking in credibility. Despite this lack of credibility, ASIC has dealt with the complainant's reports of misconduct seriously and on their merits. As I mentioned at the outset, given the complainant indicated he'll be providing the material to multiple Senate committees, we feel it is important that the committee is advised of ASIC's awareness of this issue. To assist the committee, um, we'd like to table a copy of the letter from the complainant dated 31 May 2024. We have redacted the names and other identifying information of the complainant, his lawyer and the entity which is the subject of the complainant's reports of misconduct. Well, thank you for that. But I'll, I'll put my question again to you. Since we met on this issue, another whistleblower Another whistleblower has come forward to testify they were personally involved in moving bullion around to defeat the audit. Question, I'll read it again. Did you allow for the chance of and defeat the moving of bullion to rig the audit, to enable the rigging of the audit? Senator, if you have information from a whistleblower, we'd be grateful to receive it. Um, we, based on the information available to ASIC, we believe we have thoroughly investigated the matter um, and the audit was conducted appropriately. Can I say tomorrow, literally tomorrow, the 1st of August, is day 60. So we got, so, so, so oh, we, we, we talk about the, we, we talk about the 90 day assessment. We are, as we get into September, I'll be, may, I may come back to Melbourne to be on this forum to call for Longo to be, to step down because he's under investigation for corruption. So, so no, I mean, you know, and it's not just my referrals. There have been other referrals about ASIC to the NAC. So, you know, the one thing about the NAC is they've received probably almost two and a half, three thousand referrals about all sorts of public officials, current issues, historical issues. Um, 
and, and if you if you and I were working at the NAC today, we would see, okay, we're seeing a, a pattern of referrals about yeah. a particular department, a particular group. I am highly confident people at the NAC gong, why do we get so many referrals about ASIC? Yeah. Um, because, because there are quite a few um, have gone to ASIC. And, and can I say, there's at least three um, parties who have not referred ASIC to the NAC, but they're all saying to me in the next six months, they plan to because of what happened in their particular matter. So, so I mean, w this is gonna come to a head in, in, in one form or another, but the, you know, just talking about Longo, the proposition that the performance is getting worse according to their own statistics. Their own staff last year has said, we give the organization a 2% rating. Only in the last 48 hours did I ask some people who have sources inside ASIC, I said, has the culture improved in the last eight months? The answer is no. And Longo is out there saying, there's no case for us to be broken up. We've turned the corner, uh, you know, we're getting on with the job. I think, in, in, I think within two months, three months, um, you and I and others will be back to say, nothing has materially changed mm -hmm. at ASIC, um, and nothing will ever change until this corrupt leadership team resigns. Okay, so there's two more things we need to cover today in this discussion. The question, and you can take them whatever order you like, the question is, how do we make the recommendations stick? And you, um, you can explain your particular complaint, the John, the John Adams package. Right for the benefit of the audience. So okay, okay. So, so 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 yeah. So so now, where are we sitting with the inquiry report? So so on the on the third of July, I think it was, Senator Bragg handed down the inquiry report, um, made a speech in Parliament, got a lot of positive uh, press. You know, even though there's no case, there's a lot of voices in the media who yeah. thought it was actually a very good report. Um, so the Labor government has 90 days to respond to the report, so which will be early October. Now, what I can reveal to the audience is, is that I, a f about a month ago, met with Stephen Jones, who's the Minister for Financial Services. I met his advisor. You and I met, had a meeting with the Greens together. Yeah. Uh, we, I've spoken with the coalition. We, we know what One Nation's position is. Um, the, here's the thing. Everyone in Parliament says there's a problem, including Labor. Everyone in Parliament says that we must embrace reform, including Labor. The question becomes is, what does reform look like? Um, Senator Bragg has said it's, they want to, uh, you know, it's time to break it up and abolish ASIC. Uh, I think it's fair to say that One Nation is of a similar mind. Uh, early indications from the Greens are they're heading in that direction. The only people who oppose breaking up ASIC well, was the Labor Party, but Labor has had more than two years in power yeah. to embrace this issue. And in 2022, I had meetings with Labor senators about ASIC. And obviously, you've, you've made the point on, on this show and other shows that before the election, the 2022 election, Labor was super aggressive about ASIC's yep. failings. Yep. Um, in my conversations with Labor senators in 2022, they said to me, we need to fix this problem, otherwise it's going to become our problem, as in the Labor Party. And lo and behold, Chalmers and Jones has done nothing for two years, and um, not only on this issue, but a whole host of issues, this Albanese government has just um, failed to embrace the, the, the big challenges of the day um, across a number of policy issues. And th this is and going can to- Can I say, that's, they, were in, they were in opposition for nine years when all these other inquiries were held except the current one. Yes. Right, so the big 2014 one, the 2018 Royal Commission, the 2021 Sterling Inquiry, and Labor was the financial victim's best friend. Yes. Right, they were excoriating of ASIC. Mm -hmm. and, and now, you know, I quoted Professor Andy Schmulo, Social Professor Andy Schmulo, from his podcast, making the point that, you know, there seems to be this role reversal thing, game that the major parties play, that in opposition, they're fierce critics of ASIC, in government, they're suddenly protective of ASIC. And that tells you there's someone else in charge when you see that kind of um, dynamic. So I think it's unforgivable. And, and the, public, the public has a choice here, John. They can, they can see that and hear what we've just said and go, yeah, you know, what do you expect? That's politics, they're all on the take. Or you can stop expecting to be taken advantage of and demand that no, government has to be better than this, right? And that means hold and demand labor step up and hold them to account. And here we've got an excellent inquiry with excellent, excellent recommendations and the public should demand that they implement those recommendations. Uh, 
to, to, totally. So, 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 in terms of where do we go from here? So, I think we do have to wait to some degree to see what Labor is actually going to respond. Formal, um, yeah. Look, what their formal response is. <coughs> but, 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 but I think this is an ultimate showdown in the ballot box. And, and so, if members of the public are watching this recording, I want you to call your. If you have a local Labor federal member or your Labor senator, and tell them, if you do not fix ASIC, you will, I will vote. I will vote you out of office. That's the only language that that Labor will understand because everything, every other overture that that you know you and I and others have made to Labor has so yeah. far fallen on deaf ears. Even though they say that reform has to happen, but again. What the Bragg inquiry shows is that um, there has been m multiple attempts over 30 years at piecemeal reform, a, a change here, a change there. And even the former Senator Bill O'Chee from the 1990s came back in this inquiry and said, we were provided various assurances, we, we, we were told that things would be fixed, um, and we were naive, um, and we've had multiple attempts to fix this. Um, you know. Piecemeal reform yeah. will, will not work, no. um, and 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 that's why if if, if Labor does come down and say piecemeal reform um, uh, or, or a change here or change there, but but nothing, you know, I mean, basically Bragg said we have to burn it down, we have to burn it down, we have to come up with new organisations, new new acts of parliament, um, new leadership teams, and new staff, and and, 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 and but also because. One of, the, one of the concerns, and I've had this concern, and I'm interested to hear if you've heard this, Robbie, is people have said, even if you break up ASIC into two organisations, it's the same staff. Yeah. So, 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 so what fundamentally changes? And, and so, so, so that's why I, I think, now again, it, it's, it's a process that will take a few years to do. I think the current staff, and the, particularly the leadership team, they have to be turfed out, and we need to bring competent leaders. Well, I used to make the joke that w they should make um, Denise Braley the the uh, the chair of ASIC for a year or so, right? So she can literally kick heads. Pearl, Pearl Denise is, um, you know, she's probably not physically up to that anymore. But there are people out. If you were, if, if we were the government, I'd say to someone like um, Andy Schmulo, Professor Andy Schmulo, you you go and chair ASIC and you clean it up. And somewhat people from outside, the critics. You've got to bring in the critics, right, who can tell you what the failings actually were and actually have an intention to clean this up. You cannot clean up from the inside. It won't work. Yes. Yes. Um, now, I was going to add, though, to what you said about, because it's always an excellent idea, call, call your Labor members of Parliament. But also, you've got to hedge your bets. And this is not a reflection on Andrew Bragg. and Because I don't even believe that the, the Labor people... In, when in opposition who were so um, forceful in representing financial victims like the, the ones who took up the Sterling case, etc. I think they were probably mostly sincere. In fact, I don't have any reasons to think they weren't sincere. But what tends to happen is they get once they get into government, there's someone else of a higher rank who is there to block them and say, no, no, no that's not going to happen. There's reasons we can't do that. And so what you've got to do is also to talk to your Liberal members of Parliament and Coalition members of Parliament and say, are you going to deliver on Bragg's recommendations if you get elected? Mm -hmm. And put mm -hmm. them on the spot. So they all know that this, is, this, is a, this, this should have all been done, John, after 2018, after the Banking Royal Commission, and it wasn't. And so we're saying, we've, now we've got this report and these recommendations, now's the time to do it. But it'll only happen if the public demand it. 100%. 100%. All right, in the time we've got left, what do you, let's tell us about your, your particular case and what you can say about it. Well, well, I mean, okay, so, so, so historically, we talked about one package. Now, this is the first time I'm going to mention <laughs> this. There's not one package, there's three. Three. It's three. So, so, so here's what happened. I went to, ask, look, again, I won't get into too much of the detail because there are still sure. things afoot. But in essence, I went to ASIC in April of 2022 with the package, the 600-page uh, report. ASIC investigated some of the allegations and not others. Um, I found this out last year and, and, and I went back to my legal team and said, well, the ones that ASIC did not investigate, is there a good legal basis for why they decided not to? And we couldn't, we couldn't figure out why they didn't because 
um, it was all redacted under legal professional privilege. So uh, I basically had to write a 100-page legal report of my own. I'm an economist, not a lawyer, so, but I had to hire lawyers um, and obviously read, I read the case law and I basically said, well, this is what the court requires, the seven tests around managed investment schemes. Um, I think we will write all along. Um, investigate. So I handed in package number two on the 1st of November last year um, and, and, and that um, uh, the second investigation, so we talk about less than 1% for one, I got a second one and that started on the 11th of November and that technically is still ongoing. So I have no, no idea what's happened there. But what happened with this the first investigation is I went after the PM's mates. Um, they started the investigation on the 4th of July 2022. On the 10th of August last year, I get a letter from ASIC to say after a thorough investigation, we find no evidence of a crime. Now, um, it, it took me and a team of three other people, we spent eight months full time and I was working around the clock 100 hours a week to reconstruct ASIC's investigation. And how did I reconstruct it? We, we, we bombarded ASIC with freedom of information requests um, to get the dates of certain events of the investigation. And then I, we used uh, via Senator Roberts uh, questions on notice via the inquiry to get certain information as well. And we were able to reconstruct what did ASIC do in this investigation? Um, uh, b because again, what I will say is the allegation was that in the Australian bullying industry, there was a substantial amount of gold and silver, of investors' gold and silver that was physically missing. Um, and there was a potential fee for no service scheme on foot. And so the question I had was, well, I mean, in, in, the, in the first package, I had a whistleblower says it's, it's, go it's all gone. Uh, didn't know where the um, didn't know where the gold and silver was. I tried to locate it myself. I couldn't find it. So, so it's like to ask, where was it? Now, um, how? Let me let me ask you this, Robbie. Um, and again, but you know the answer. So it's a little bit sort of uh, you know I can't really you know get your honest surprise <laughs> answer. But if I said to you, Robbie, um, phys the allegation is that physical gold and silver is missing as part of a fraud scam. Um, and and these are these are retail investors. How long would you expect, um, given that you're a taxpayer? How long would you expect um, ASIC officials to go actually look physically for the gold and silver? Well, that to me sounds like it's the heart of the investigation, and it yes. should should have happened probably the first day. And how long do you think it took ASIC to invest? No, but again, because this is not just a company. This is the friends of Albanese. How long do you think it took for ASIC to go physically look for Albo's mates? I asked Con the fruiter and he said it would have been a couple of days, but it was a bit longer than that. It was nine and a half months. Nine and a half months of, so, so again, the parliament has given ASIC extraordinary powers, including yes. search warrants, including seizing documents, seizing computers, all sorts of things that they could have done. And they did not leave the office for nine and a half months. Um, and then when they did leave in, uh, after nine and a half months, they, they <coughs> they conducted a so-called forensic audit with Deloitte, uh, a, a team from Deloitte. So what do you think happened in the nine and a half months? Um, well, that's, that's what we, once we understood the time frame, we then went back to see, well, wh what did the company actually do in this nine and a half period? Um, and what, we, what I say is that there was a cover-up in the nine and a half month period, which was nine and a half months is, a, is enough time to make a fair amount of bullion materialize. Y yes, yes, but 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 but, but now there, there there was some gold and silver in existence, uh, but 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 it was it was held in a compromising position. If I'll, I'll say yeah. nothing more than that, but then it was moved in the nine and a half month period to an illegal spot uh, under New South Wales law. Um, and how and, and, and so we I had to go get independent legal advice from a specialist uh, property lawyer in, in New South Wales and they said yep all illegal um, and and yet uh, somehow ASIC missed that, that and I was able to find it the so-called conspiracy theorists found it and I have independent legal advice to, to back it up but then so that's that's the cover-up number one the cover-up number two is this so-called audit that ASIC used one hundred thirty six thousand dollars of taxpayers money they gave Albo's mates every opportunity to pass the audit. Um, th think of, 
you know, your kids sitting for a school test. They gave them the, the, the questions, they gave them the answers that they basically said, you know, um, you know, they effectively coached the, per the company they're investigating for three months to say, we're coming to do an audit, be ready. Um, um, you know, we're coming soon, we're coming soon. Um, because they didn't ask, they didn't execute a search warrant. So they need to get the permission of the company. We're going to come onto your property. Is this okay? So they coached them, but then just to make sure they passed the audit, they did as uh, four site inspections as part of this audit process. What do they do? Ten days out before the first site inspection, they gave them ten days notice to say, you know, <laughs> just in case if you weren't sure when we're coming, we're coming in ten <laughs> days. We're coming in ten days, and I'm thinking to myself. This has all the hallmarks of corruption. It is rigged from start to finish. This was never a genuine investigation. Um, and, and, and this is... So not exactly Elliot Ness in the untouchables, kicking in the doors with the machine guns and no. breaking open the cases. No, 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 no. So, 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 we, so again, so there's, there's plenty more to come on this story. Um, but, but, you know, uh, but, but this third package is 206 pages, over 200 exhibits, very specific evidence of certain things happening on certain days, um, documents, witnesses, um, and, 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 you know, the fact that I've had to go through this exercise myself, um, the cost, the time, yeah. the stress, um, look, I mean, you said to me about package one, no one would have done package one. Right. The fact that I had to do packages two and three to get to the real truth of the matter and ASIC still let elbows mates off the hook. Oh, oh, it is, you know, I'm gonna say 100%, there is nothing more, this is textbook corruption that we, that I saw in this particular investigation. And that's why I refer them to the NAC. So when people, if you do play the clip of Chris mm -hmm. Savandra blowing up in estimates, how dare John mm -hmm. Adams send us to the National Anti-Corruption Commission? Don't he, doesn't he know that we're ethical people and we're upstanding and all of that sort of stuff? Bullshit, bullshit. I'm, I'm not gonna pay to, you know, I had multiple arguments at home about this and I said to my wife, I would never live in a country that is systematically corrupt. Um, and again, if you're paying taxes to the police and the police have powers of a search warrant, um, we gave them enough two yep. years ago to go within 48 hours to go look and they sat on their ass for nine and a half months. That is completely unacceptable. And John, just for a bigger picture thing briefly, we just we'll spent a couple of minutes on this. Um, one of the reasons this is a particular issue that, that you're going after is because you're one person who for a long time has warned against the, a, a, a problem in the bullion sector where people think they're buying bullion and they're actually not. They're, they're, not, they're buying paper, basically, and they're not actually buying bullion. So, what, what, he, and it's he, a systemic problem in what, the sector. Well, look, but, but when we say the sector, the sector is not just Australia. It's, yeah. it's, it's global. global. And, and again, so, so you've got different parts of the sector. You have the banks. Who, who would dabble in this stuff, but then you also have um, uh, specific bullion companies. But, but you know, let, let me give you one example is, I think it was Morgan Stanley, who um, in, in, I think around 2005, 2006 got caught having taken investor money to buy physical silver as part of an investment product. The physical, they never bought the silver. Mm -hmm. They took the money, and then when, they, then when they were sued in a class action, their defense, this is in the US. You want to know what their defense is? This is standard industry practice. We don't need to buy it. <laughs> um, it's just like a straight out fraud. Um, so, so, so again, so, so, so you know, there's fraud in the physical market, there's fraud in the futures market. Obviously, Senator Rennick has been super aggressive uh, with the RBA about Australia's yeah, gold. gold. And, yeah. and, and you, know, you and I and, and, and Martin North back in 2018, we, we talked quite extensively on YouTube about the 80 tons of gold and the RBA order process with the Bank of England, etc. And Senator Rennick watched our content and then t has taken that fight up in Parliament with the RBA. So, so th there's plenty of criminality in this sector worldwide. So the, I don't want this to say that the sector's no, clean and we've got one yeah. problem. But, no. but, but again, but, but in, how did this whole situation happen? In 2021, a woman went to get her silver and she was told it was missing. And then within two weeks, I had dinner with someone in this country um, who worked at a particular company. And this is what was our first whistleblower. And he, 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 he was of the genuine belief he was part of a fraud operation. All right. Well, listen, you've, you've spent an hour with us with a croaky voice. We appreciate that. I th you've, um, you've earned the right to plug your little um, uh, 
piece of, I think this is technically bullion, isn't it? Yeah, I, I yeah, know it's a yeah. coin. So yes. just, just tell the audience what that is. Well, so, so, so yeah, so, so for the last 12 months, I've been in the, so I, I'm actually in the bullying, so I've been in the bullying sector for about, since 2018. I did work for one company. Um, and then when I started to look at um, the systemic issues in the system, uh, in, in the Australian market, I thought to myself, well, I mean, perhaps the most ethical thing that I could do is actually open up my own shop, um, um, where, whereas uh, we can offer an ethical service that, that we can ensure that investors' assets are safe. And so one of the things we're doing in the bullion sector, Robbie, which is very unique, is why do people buy gold and silver? Um, it is in my in my way of thinking. It is insurance. You're insuring against inflation, financial instability, um, uh, money printing, corruption, um, uh, you know, rogue rogue military, etc. So um, there's plenty of risk out there, and 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 gold and silver has been the the safe haven. Ha the safe haven asset that has um, uh, stood the test of time for about five thousand years. So so if you are buying insurance against the system. And when I've been in Parliament and people said, what are you doing now? I'm selling insurance against your incompetence and corruption. I've told, <laughs> I told the Shadow Treasurer that two years ago and he actually laughed. But, but again, if, 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 you're in, if in essence you're buying insurance um, against, the, against the political system, um, I think it's only fitting to put politics on the product. And, and, and when you look at the Australian market, most of the product is either corporate brands or animals like the kangaroo or the koala or the emu, etc. Yeah. Like so to celebrate um, our efforts uh, with the defeat of the cash ban, we, we, we've produced um, at Adams Bullion our first uh, uh, one ounce silver round. So this is 99.9% .9 pure. Um, and we'll hold it up for the audience, but it says Australians will never surrender their right to physical money. Um, whether that's cash or gold, silver, etc., and on the outer it says the Australian people defeated the establishment's ten thousand dollar cash transaction ban, 2019-2020. So, so we've been selling these for a while now, uh, and we've sold a lot, and we are going to um, uh, go nationwide because uh, because I've been focused on ASIC for two years. You've been focused on the banks and cash. I want to come back to the next time we, we, I'm here in the studio, I want to talk to you about cash. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, and obviously we see the crowd strike issue in the last yeah. fortnight and, and the importance of having um, access to physical money, um, particularly with this push uh, in terms of the digital system. But, but, uh, but, but this is our first product and within a few weeks, we are going to come out with Australia's first ASIC corruption coin. Um, <laughs> there you go, you've heard it here first. So, so, so yes, yeah, so, so we, are, we are going to sell these products because people can buy gold and silver from a, a whole host of entities in Australia. So it's like, so, so why do business with us? It's because um, you know, you're, you're actually supporting a movement um, to have a better country. Um, and, and, and we feel that if you can put political messages on the product, this will help spread the message to, so you know, investors will show their friends and family, I bought this cash bean coin, um, this is the story. Because a lot of people, look, a lot, obviously the informed people like your audience knows about the cash bean story, a lot of people don't. Mm. And so I think it's, uh, particularly given that in the last uh, you know, 12 months, the Albanese government has brought in hundreds of thousands of new immigrants. We need to teach the new that's arrivals true, that's to true. Australia. And they uh, love uh, cash. And they love cash. They should, they should be afraid of how close it came to being banned, but we, that it was a great victory. Victory, I mean, that we pulled off in 2019, 2020 to force them to drop that. So look, that, if people want to follow that, they can look up Adam's Bullion. Yes, what yes. it's called. Adam's Bullion. Yes. All right. And, and um, John, I think it'd be remiss of us to finish this without acknowledging it. You, you mentioned you had some um, uh, uh, allies in your in your investigation that you described just then. We should, we should do a call out to one of those, a mutual friend, Jeremy Glass, the great Jeremy Glass. Yes. Who's, who was one of, the, one of your team there. Um, and we both you know, appreciate Jeremy's insights and consult with him um, on these matters. So good on you, Jeremy. Um, and to finish on a political note, because we, have, we did try and target an hour here, we've gone over. So we will, by the time, by the time you've got to this start, part of the show, you will notice you did get to see the Chris Savundra um, uh, testimony in the in the Senate, so we won't put we need to put the link below. Um, uh, but remember what John said: call the Labor Party people and demand that they implement those recommendations of the ASIC inquiry. Because we'll never clean up the banks; 
which are completely corrupt and have way too much power, if the policeman is on the take. And, and I, I'm reminded right then saying that, John, that where what um, uh, one of my last conversations with Fraser Brindley is he was, I, I used the metaphor of Al Capone and the Chicago police. I was about to mention right? that. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the point, right? The, the, um, Elliot Ness had to create the untouchables. Untouchable meant they weren't corruptible like the rest of the Chicago police before, yes. they, could, before they could take down Al Capone. The banks are Al Capone and we've got to clean up the Chicago police. So, John Adams, thank you very much for joining us today on Citizens Insight. Thank you. Thanks to the viewer. Tune in for more later.